Hey everyone, my name is Simpsy. How you all doing? Welcome to the start of a brand new Medieval 2 Total War Definitive Edition campaign on Stainless Steel 6.4. We're playing with Savage AI as the Republic of Novgorod. We're playing as Russia. So, like, subscribe, all that good YouTube stuff. Never played as Russia on Medieval 2 Total War. Have never done a campaign. So, I feel like vanilla for Russia is a little bit bare bones, so I thought we'd jump on to one of my favorite Medieval 2 mods, Stainless Steel. The main objective of this series is to russify Eastern Europe, spread Russian Orthodoxy. So, without further ado, let's get stuck into the campaign. We want to form the Grand Duchy of Moscow and then ultimately Tsardom of Russia. But we are going to have to watch out for the Kuman Khanate to the east, the pesky Grand Duchy of Kiev, the pagan Lithuanians, and the Kingdom of Poland. So we're playing in a late era campaign in the summer of 1220 AD. So the timeline is a little bit off. It is not as perfect of a family tree as you would see in SSH IP. So we're currently under the reign of faction leader Vesevolov. The first of Kiev, I think historically this is who this is meant to be. And our prince and heir is Vladimir II. We also have Rostislav, another princeling, and Eupraxia, the princess as well. Family tree-wise, looking good. Four male heirs, one princess, then obviously the faction leader. I think I'm going to go with elective monarchy in this series. It's just easier in Medieval 2. Alright, let's check out our city situation. We have eight cities in total, stretching in and around modern-day Russia and Belarus. We have Peskov, which is near Estonia. We have the city of Palatsik, which is in modern-day Belarus. We have Novgorod, of course, Smolensk, and Moscow. Novgorod is actually our capital, not Moscow at the moment. Yaroslavl, the city of Ryazan, and lastly to the east, Murom. So we are going to have a bit of a slow start for this series as Eastern Europe is so vast and massive over here. Our roster isn't the best as well. It's kind of bad, kind of like Scotland's. So numbers are going to be our priority. We will get some better quality units towards the mid to late game. It's going to be plenty of rebels and I'm not going to lie. Playing as Russia in the east is a bit of a tough start, start so we are going to have to be careful. There's a lot of surrounding potential enemies. Not only did I mention before that we have to probably deal with the Cumans, Kiev, Lithuania and Poland. There's still the Teutonic Order. I think the Danes are near us as well. We've even got the Republic of Genoa back in Crimea. But I think pushing westward as much as we can, that's where all the valuable cities are going to be with the largest pops. And in the east, we're just going to have to not commit too many forces to that eastern expansion because you're just going to get cut down by Cumans and Cossack horsemen. But we do want to try and subjugate the east as well. We will have to look out for the Mongols over there as well. But we do want to, as we push west, commit some resources to that ever-expanding eastern frontier. Army comp-wise, we do have a bunch of Drazina, both cavalry and infantry variant. Got a bunch of crossbow militia, and then just your regular senior Rus militia as well. So, I think what our first objective is to try and put watchtowers throughout our lands to see throughout the thick forests here in our Rus lands. Then we want to rally up with every single unit we possibly can and then we'll look to try and gobble up that neighboring rebel territory. So we've got a bit of a cluster here of cities on the west which is really quite nice and we'll set somewhere in this forest between Peskov and Novgorod. Then these four cities as well. We'll try and get an additional stack. So there already seems to be a rebel territory down in the south, which we want to try and grab. 
and once we've sort of taken all the available rebel territory which haven't sphere, uh, sw a sworn fealty to some of the surrounding states we might look to go after a major faction um, I'm thinking potentially the principality of Kiev or Kiev as they are orthodox and it will be easier to conquer them and convert rather than the Catholic Poles or pagan Lithuanians all right Welcome to the top of the turn. I'd rather not adopt you yet, but I am not opposed to bringing in different characters. So let's rally up here. So we've nearly got a full stack. And I could send this south to try and find some rebel territory. Or I could just thunder run it to Kiev and see what happens. YOLO. Jokes. We'll take it a bit slower. Um, so we've got one full stack here. So I think we go... For this rebel territory. We've got a bunch of spies. We will need to spread orthodoxy as well. We will always have to keep in the back of our head that we are an orthodox faction. And that the Pope can call a crusade. But if we can get sort of westward to the Carpathian Mountains. Get that land corridor secured. That would be good. I wouldn't even mind going for like Constantinople or something. Moscow is the third Rome after all. But the Turks and the Byzantines are going to be fighting over that city. So, we'll try and get our territory to the height of Tsardom slash Imperial Russia. And we probably want to try and get the princess married off as well. We do have a bunch of nobles which have decent command. And we'll try and bring them in. So, this is the territory we fully currently own. It's going to take a little bit of time logistically to move around and uh, we do have access to quite a large variety of ballista so continue on okay welcome to the top of the turn the charismian leader is now dead suitable prince he's now 50 no the grand tower in seville has been built they want me to send an emissary oh the mongols have invaded and a great council wants us to pay them off, uh, sure. Poland and Hungary have made an alliance. Uh-oh. Okay, so let's move our spies further south. Instead of going into the forest where rebels and bandits lie. It's always good having spies go first to gain us some intelligence. We will get a battle. We will have a fair few battles in this... Uh, probably hour-long part once I edit it down. I'm going to sit down and record for two, three hours here today. And we'll see how we go. So we'll start making our way down to Serdobinskaya. I think now that's Serdosk. And then we need to take Boryansk. So it's going to take a little while to slowly but surely move down logistically to those cities that we want to take and conquer. So I thought... Why not? Let's talk about some history about the Republic of Novgorod. I'll also talk about some history throughout battles as well. So we'll sort of sprinkle it throughout this series as we're just doing some movement management stuff. Alrighty, so the Republic of Novgorod emerged as a prominent center of trade, culture and politics in what is now Russia. Its history can be traced back to the 9th century when it was established as a fortified settlement along the river Volkov. Novgorod's early development was significantly influenced by the Varangians, Scandinavian traders and warriors who integrated with the local Slavic populace. By the 12th century, which is what we're playing in, Novgorod had evolved into a powerful republic with a unique system of governance. Unlike many of the other feudal societies in this game, Novgorod was characterized by a form of proto-democracy. The city was ruled by a public assembly of free citizens, which elected the prince and other key officials, like the mayor and military leader. This governance structure allowed for a significant degree of local autonomy and civic participation. So, we might just go with a merit-based faction leader and heir. We might have some links to royalty, but I think we'll go by merit rather than male preference primogenitor and focusing on dynastic rule, really, and keeping, keeping like a, a really strong line of descendants. I think whoever is the best for the job 
should, well, lead this country. Economically, Novgorod thrived due to its strategic position on the trade routes between the Baltic Sea and the Byzantium Empire. So hopefully we can make an alliance or maybe trade with them. I believe Constantinople at this point is a rebel settlement. It's meant to be um, simulating the Latin Empire rule, I believe. The Byzantines are mostly in Nicaea and they've got the Turks as well. So there's going to be those two factions fighting over Constantinople. Maybe we can become the third fighting for it. So the city became a really crucial hub for f facilitating and exchanging goods such as fur, wax, honey, and luxury goods from the east. Uh, Novgorod's wealth and economic power was reflected in its like really cool architecture, including various structures created in the 12th century. Culturally, Novgorod was a beacon of literacy and artistic achievement. It was known for its vibrant iconography, which you can see in various orthodox churches. The city also fostered a rich tradition of epic poetry and religious texts. Despite this prosperity though, Novgorod did face constant <laughs> threats from external powers and opponents. The Mongols invaded in the 13th century and resulted in the submission of Novgorod to the Golden Horde. So that's definitely something we have to watch out for. The city did manage to maintain a degree of autonomy, yes. paying tribute of course. In the 15th century, the growing power of the Grand Duchy of Moscow posed a new threat and a series of conflicts culminated between the two. The decisive battle of Sheldon in 1471 and in 1478, yes. Ivan of Moscow annexed Novgorod, effectively ending its independence. This incorporation of Novgorod into the Grand Duchy of Moscow marked the end of the Republic, but its legacy endures. The cultural and political traditions of Novgorod influenced the development of the Russian state and contributed to the rich tapestry of Russian history. So yeah, hopefully you enjoyed that short brief history on the Republic of Novgorod. I did a lot of university work more so on 17th and 18th century Russia with uh, the likes of Peter the Great, but I do quite enjoy early Russian history, like the Republic of Novgorod and the Duchy of Moscow and stuff. A lot of it is sort of intertwined. So hopefully we can talk about more of it in this particular series. So let's move away from the history element and zoom back into this particular campaign. So we're five turns in. We're just looking around the Baltics here. So the Danes, the Teutonic Order, and Lithuania is nearby. We shouldn't have too much of an issue pushing into Lithuania because at this time period they are pagan and the Catholic Danes, along with the militant Teutonic Order, are going to be coveting their lands as much as we are. So we are moving Vesevolod, our faction leader, south to Kiev to look to try and take the city. So we are trespassing now, and we've already sieged out Sadovsks as well. And we're just trying to move into range. Okay, so there's half a stack there as we, well, <laughs> thunder run to Kiev. Okay, suitable prince, Borislav, 32. I think we can find someone a bit better. The mounted crossbow has been developed. Papal Inquisition is starting to begin. And our construction is slowly coming along. We've gone through and built and commissioned a bunch of communal farms throughout the Republic and now we can probably go with a mixture of tax bonuses, inns for spies, but making sure we get the tax bonus is probably ideal for this time period. Okay, so just trying to move my spies around to just give us some better intelligence. We need to make sure the princess gets married off as well. And we'll try and make trade and get map information. Um, beta. Hmm. I don't know who I should marry her off to. Radagost. I think this guy looks a bit better. He's a pretty good commander, but he's 45. Doesn't have much loyalty. That's the only issue. He's a lot more oil loyal to the cause. Siv Bolol, I think, will marry 
him into the family tree. So already, the family tree is growing quite rapidly. Vladimir, the heir, has two sons and two daughters. So we're going to negotiate with the Kingdom of Denmark here. And they're going to give us trade and maps. So they have Rivel. So I guess it's like Estonia to the north. Interesting. So what we consider the Baltic states aren't really a, a thing at the moment. Riga is held by the Teutonic Order. Interesting. Still got Finland to the north as well. Might not be a bad idea to push into that area. Karelia and whatnot. But Sweden and Denmark you seem to be a unified kingdom. Then we've got Norway to the west. Okay, so maybe we try and farm the experience with you. Now you've just married a princess. Alright, so let's face Captain Vratimir for our first battle of the series. Two Cossack archers, two spearmen. And just two unmounted. Alright, here we go. So let's have the siege. Our first of the series. Let's see how we go. Okay, look, you know what? This isn't going to be the most complicated battle, as we outnumber them quite significantly, but it's our first battle of the series. I kind of want to show off the General's Bodyguard and some of the various units. They just look so, so cool in Stainless Steel. I love the orthodox aesthetic of the uh, the factions. Well, look at this, the armor, the swords, the chainmail looks so good. All right, well... Let's talk a little history, I think. We should be able to allow Izia Slav to really take the reins on this one. So, we're going to talk about Vesevolod, the first of Kiev. Now, this is who we're playing as in this mod. The timeline's a little bit off. We're starting in 1200 AD. But Vesevolod was a prominent ruler of the Kievan Rus, serving as the Grand Prince of Kiev from 1076 to 1077 and then again from 1078 to 1093. He was born in 1030, the son of Yaroslav the Wise, one of the most noble rulers of the Kievan Rus and his wife was of Swedish descent. The Sevalod was a part of a significant ruling dynasty that helped play a crucial role in shaping Eastern Medieval Europe. Vesevolod's early years were marked by his father's efforts to consolidate and expand the territory of Kievan Rus, and in 1046 he married Anastasia of Byzantium, strengthening ties with the Byzantine Empire. This alliance underscored the strategic diplomatic engagements that characterized his reign and that of his predecessors. So, I wonder if we can replicate that alliance somehow. Upon the death of Yaroslav the Wise in 1051, the Kievan Rus were divided amongst his sons, with Yaroslav receiving the main principality. This division, intended to prevent internal strife, eventually led to a fracture of conflicts. Vesevolod's initial reign as Grand Prince of Kiev in 1070 was brief as he was stepped aside in favor of his brother, Izyaslav I. However, following Izyaslav's death in 1078, Vesevolod ascended to the throne, ruling until his own death. Vesevolod's reign was marked by both internal and external challenges. Internally, he faced the opposition from various factions within Kievan Rus, including conflicts with his nephews and other regional princes. His reign was also notable for its cultural and intellectual developments. The Cephalod was a patron of the art, as all good Russians are, and educated in contributing to the flourishing Kievan Rus culture. He continued his father's efforts in strengthening the Christian faith within his realm, supporting the construction of various churches and monasteries. Externally, the Sevalod dealt with threats from the nomadic Cuman and maintained a complex relationship with the Byzantium Kingdom and Poland. Despite these challenges, his reign was often seen as a period of relative stability and consolidation after the turbulence following his father's death. Vesevolod died April 13, 1093, leaving a legacy of leadership during the transformation period of Kievan Rus history. His son, Vladimir, succeeded him, who 
hopefully well in this particular campaign. We'll talk about him a little bit later. But he continued the family's influence of the House of Rurik on the region's political and cultural landscapes. Vesevalod had a massive contribution to the consolidation and cultural development of Kievan Rus and is remembered to this day as a significant part of Russian and Eastern medieval history. So I hope you enjoyed that short, brief history of Vesevalod. We're going to talk about Vladimir and various other historical factoids throughout this series but if there's anything specific you want me to hone in on that we can talk about let me know in the comments okay so is he a slav so far in this siege is doing okay it's about 70 percent in our favor we've lost three percent knocking out 13 of theirs we're slowly but surely swarming in our spear militia and we're going to be, hopefully, able to take our first city for this series. As we get battle-hardened and ready to move against a major faction, which is the Grand Duchy of Kiev. I think pushing in there, assimilating the cities, will be much easier to do so then. Potentially Poland, the Teutonic Order, and maybe even Lithuania later down the line. Okay, so the walls are mostly under our control. Our have their worth today. The now we can look to move in some of the heavy, heavier cavalry as well. But early on, our roster isn't the best. Okay, so... They've lost half their men now. The enemy are badly battered. That's pretty good. Okay. We've comfortably taken the gatehouse. And... The walls. And then soon the city. And I'm going to try and keep track... As to which of my generals take what... Cities and castles and various towns and battles as well so we can have our own sort of little campaign sandbox history so if Izzyaslav for example just randomly becomes faction leader oh yeah so he helped us early on take Sudos I like to sort of log that through campaigns but yeah highly recommend Downloading Stainless Steel 6.4. Um, it's been a while since I've downloaded and played it. So I think Savage AI is the best when loading up. Um, let me know. SS Connoisseurs. I'd like to know. But I think Savage AI is the best. What does everyone tend to play these days? Because it's still a relatively older mod. But who doesn't love a little bit of Stainless Steel? The campaign map is massive, and it's just, I don't know, modded Medieval 2 is just so much better than vanilla in my opinion. I don't mind the occasional campaign. Nice, clear victory, we only lost 300 men, and Captain Ratamir is no more. Okay, clear victory to Izyaslav. And Sudosk is now ours, a wooden castle on the frontier. We're going to be able to get military units from there. Okay, so we managed to get three archers in Novgorod, which is fantastic if I do say so myself. It is quite orthodox, so that's good. We don't have to convert and commission chapels necessarily early on, but it'll be something we want to do eventually. We also want to do the priest game as well. So let's build a watchtower here and probably send that eastward. Oh, okay, so it looks like they're fighting over this settlement, potentially. Kiev has sent a half a stack while Lithuania is there as well. Interesting, okay. I'm trying to think, should we hit the armies now that they're out in the field? Or should we try and go for the capital itself? I think maybe sieging it out is probably not a bad idea. Because now we are at war with them. And then we'll see how they ultimately react and, oh, they have a Vesevalod as well. So I guess it's like both of them claim to be the 
uh, real the civil lord, <laughs> I suppose. I've never played as the Grand Duchy of Kiev either. So we'll move the half a stack up. And send the turn to continue. Okay, so we have been attacked here with Vladimir. Okay, this is going to be tough. Um, that's a pretty good army. So we basically need to delay and let them not take Kiev. So Vladimir, son and heir. Potential faction leader is going to play this one. So this one might be a little bit micro heavy. So we'll see how we go. We have three units of Cossack horse archers, one unit of infantry, two units of archers, crossbow, and then the general unit itself. All right, so we managed to catch the sons of Kiev pushing westward as the Lithuanians looked to, t to take one of their neighboring cities. This army's now come back as Kiev is under siege by the Republic of Novgorod and Vesevolod. Now, looking at the topography of this battlefield, a lot of forest, it's okay. We do manage to have some high ground, which is nice. Might be able to get a general charge here. Nice, we're going to be able to mix up some of the firing pattern at the back. Get a good charge with Vladimir. Oh, perfect. We're going to crush those skirmishes. And if we can try and use our horse archer advantage to try and skirmish as many of them as we can, that would be ideal. And Vladimir will be able to earn his first... But okay. Our men are, our men are winning the battle. If we like this, we will Apparently, if we continue like this, we're going to be able to smash them. Just have to be careful there. They're starting to move their own missile cavalry. Let's make sure these guys definitely don't come back. As our general's bodyguard is running down. Uh, we've got a axe unit here, so try and move that up. Not the most heavily armoured. But we'll still be able to pack a punch. But fighting similar orthodox factions, I would imagine both us being the descendants of Kievan Rus. We'll have a similar unit roster. I think annexing the Grand Duchy the quicker the better to be honest. Okay. So we need to watch out for that militia. We will try and cycle charge where we can. But we've managed to catch them there as they move westward. Oh, and perfect. The enemy general flees. The Kiev captain is a coward, supposedly. Okay, let's try and run down that. To be fair, they haven't got a general's bodyguard, and we're using the air. You do get some pretty decent bonuses with faction leaders in Medieval 2 and in Stay in the Steel. Sometimes you've got the faction leader. In a settlement. They can nearly hold it off. Nice! The enemy general has now fallen. Captain Grigori is no more. And I can't imagine them really coming back from this. We're not favoured to win this one. It's a little bit deceiving, the order resolve. It can be really, really harsh. Particularly in Medieval 2. And of course, Stainless Steel. Because we've got skirmisher supremacy, we should be able to kite, drag, and run them around the battlefield. We're still not out of the woods just yet. They're still not going to give me the balance of power win, supposedly. So, what we're going to need to do is drag and really stretch those enemy combatants. Now, thankfully, we've been a little bit lucky, battlefield-wise. A lot of highs and lows, and it's not the most conducive for 
terrain movement. They're probably quite exhausted pushing up hills and whatnot. Okay, so they're now routing as well. So we've had one successful siege. And now we're going to have an open field battle, which is going to be successful. Vladimir will need to be a little bit careful because general bodyguards can be a little bit squishy in medieval 2 and in the earlier Total Wars like this in the Rome Remaster and Rome Total War. But this is going to be a daily series, so strap yourselves in, like, subscribe, all that good YouTube stuff. Leave a comment for the algorithm, it helps, and also watch to the end. I would appreciate it. And... Okay, we're now we're just decimating <laughs> that unit. Oh my god. But there's going to be so many cool, unique factions that we're going to be fighting in this particular series. Although in this neck of the woods, it's going to be a little bit tiresome to move about logistically, which will be a bit of a pain, but we're going to be fighting Cumans, we could be fighting Turks, the Republic of Genoa is like on our doorstep as well. And then we've got pagan Lithuanians and... The Teutonic Order. Ah, oh, Vikings with the Danes. We've got so many potential adversaries. And there's so much territory that we can claim and russify and um, bring into our rule. We could even go liberate Serbia or something as well. Go out and help our boys down in the Balkans. Our Slavic bros. Maybe even build a Yugoslavia, as it were. Okay. We're going to end it there. I've just sped things up and ran down the last of them. We've won a heroic victory here, crushing a thousand of them. What a monumental victory. Oh, I could get him married off, actually. That's probably not a bad idea. Rostislav. And then we're not going to need to find a new one for him. Just a random noblewoman. It's probably not a bad idea. So let's accept the bride that's present. Get him all married off. Okay, so... Okay, spies-wise. How are we looking? Okay, slightly move around. around. Man, spies are so crucial in Total War. They don't cost that much, but... They can really, essentially just save you wasting turns sometimes. Just got to watch out for the Cumans there. Not at war with them yet. Let's build a watchtower here. And let's move to try and take more Kievan Rus territory. So, we're still sieging them out. Um, is that retreating forces, maybe? No, I think that's just new that they somehow brought up. Alright, well, let's fight this one here today. And we're going to have the... Siege of Kiev and bring down this Vesevolod Pretender. He is a superior commander, a whopping six stars. But us Russians have the numbers. Alright, let's move on up and take Kiev for the Republic of Novgorod. Vladimir the Heir is here along with Vesevolod, our aging faction leader. So as we're getting into another battle, let's talk some more history. We're going to talk about Vladimir II, who's just come off a victory on the field of battle. And now he's going to be accompanying his father in this alternative timeline, sieging the city of Kiev, and hopefully going to be bringing it under Novgorod rule. So Vladimir II, his father was Vesevolod, and his mother was Anastasia of Byzantium. He was the great-grandson, obviously, of Yaroslav the Wise and the great-grandson of Vladimir the Great. His maternal lineage traces all the way back to the Byzantine Emperor Constantine. So if we ever want to take Constantinople from the Latin Empire, we could use, this, use that as a claim. So Vladimir rose to prominence in early life, becoming the Prince of Smolensk in 1073 and later ruling... Chernigov or Chernihiv 
In 1078, he fought alongside his father and uncle against internal rivals, helping secure the throne for his father, Vesevolod I. Now, previously, when we mentioned the internal strife with Vesevolod, uh, when Vladimir's cousin ascended to the throne, uh, Vladimir, in this time period, continued to play a pretty pivotal role uh, militarily and strategically, organizing campaigns against the Cumans and helping with his father's internal strife. In 1113, a popular uprising in Kiev led Vladimir to be invited to take the throne as the Grand Prince of Kiev. Vladimir implemented several reforms aimed at consolidating power and stabilizing the realm. He is known for issuing the Statute of Vladimir, which sought to limit the power of the boyars and address various other social issues. Vladimir was also a patron of education and culture. His work, The Instructions, written for his sons, provided insights into his philosophies and challenges to his reign. The document actually emphasizes the importance of justice, morality, and responsibility of princely rule. Vladimir II's reign was marked as a period of relative stability and unity for Kievan Rus. He was succeeded by his son, Mitsislav, and continued his father's legacy. Vladimir's efforts to centralize power and maintain order continued to leave a lasting impact on this Eastern Slavic state. Okay, that's uh, enough about good old Vlad. Vladimir II. Okay, so just zooming back into and focusing in on this battle. So the city of Kiev is a large city, as you can see. Walls are quite high. They've got massive arrow towers you're going to have to watch out for. Now, they have moved out some cavalry, so I am going to be able to move our Royal Rus cavalry in. Look at this army. We've got a bunch of heavy cavalry, so that's going to be really vital to try and bring the Duchy of Kiev under heel. And fitting enough, we're going to be able to give this settlement to Vladimir, who ultimately became the Prince of Kiev, as we just talked about. Okay, so they got a unit back there. We do have Vladimir attacking from the second side. So we'll ultimately give, I guess, for several odd this victory. But Vladimir, in his story, is going to have a large contributing fact to taking the city but we are slowly but surely building up maybe at some point we can um, do a grand Kiev campaign as we move in to take Kiev okay still fighting on the walls quite quickly again with our Orthodox brothers our Slavic brethren brothers versus brothers a shame I do love the iconography there, though. But let me know in the comments, feedback and suggestions as always. I'm curious, curious to know your thoughts and opinions. And let me know what other campaigns you like me to do. We just wrapped up the Massalian campaign for Rome 2. Highly recommend it. We did the same thing, talking about antiquity history of Massalia and some of the Gallic and Roman tribes in and around there. And now we're fast-forwarded to the 12th century now, talking about Eastern Slavic and early proto-Russian history, essentially. So, not too sure what other campaigns to do. I want to try and get back into the swing of things, recording Let's Plays constantly, but just juggling my personal life and relationships. I do my best. Should be having surgery on my stuffed up arm. It's been nearly two years now. <laughs> I've been waiting. Hey. Healthcare is free in Australia. It just takes ages. <laughs> but yeah, we're getting my cubital tunnel is issue fixed. So I'll be back gaming at peak optimal level at some point. I'll be enhanced. They might even give me like a robot arm or something. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> anyway, still fighting on the walls. Um, I could move some of these other generals' bodyguards in potentially. But I'm going to be quite liberal on the adoption so maybe we adopt half of our children or so it's just a, like i don't know you should really game wise for medieval too especially for stainless steel it does cost having generals it's like a thousand per turn i think but they're just so worth it the general's bodyguard are just really really overpowered Okay. 
Still about 90% favoured to win this one. Not going to be too overly difficult of a battle. But we're focusing on gobbling up that rebel territory. Once we annex, occupy this Grand Duchy, we're going to be laughing. We're not going to need to build crazy orthodox buildings. Um, Novgorod is our capital. I could look to move it to Moscow. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. We might tack. It does cost quite a bit to transfer the capital. So we should do it sparingly. Or maybe we should do it for Constantinople at some point if we eventually go down there. But I do want to try and grab as much of the Orthodox lands as we can. There might even be like Bulgarian Orthodox lands. I can't remember. Maybe down in the Balkans as well. We shall see. But I think what you really want to focus on is Western Europe. That's where all the best cities are. And then down towards the Balkans and Greece. That's where the real economic might is going to be. Pushing into the far east, into the steppes, into Tartar and Cumin and Cossack territory. You're bound to just get run down by horse lords over there. <laughs> and kited and dragged around for territory that's sparse and not very populated. Like, you bring the pop over there and then the Mongols are probably going to show up. That's the last thing we want to do, eh? Okay. All civilized peoples will So we've won, lost 700. Um and they deployed 800, but it is their faction leader. So Vesevolod of Kiev is no more. Let's sack the city. It will harm us diplomatically, but we'll be okay. And now the capital of Kiev is now firmly under Vesevolod and Novgorod control. There's a city to the west as well we might look to go for. So we might get paved roads to be able to navigate in and around Kiev. Uh, let's try and run down Captain Radimir here. Let's ransom, so they're going to accept. And we'll rally up in Kiev and then look for the next potential target for this particular campaign. And let's move in some of those units. And let's move Vladimir there. Okay. So... He has two children, four daughters as well. Let's move this army out. Let's get the several odd there. Let's get Vladimir, because he is the prince, of course. He can sit in Kiev. Um, yeah, there's a fine line between sitting generals in cities and getting them a lot of traits and farming them, especially when there's like education buildings and whatnot. You can farm really, really good generals, but I don't know. I feel like the age is... Like, you can sit them half their lives in a settlement, and then you only need a campaign with them. Are you better off to farm them in the field their entire lives? And whatnot? I just don't know. You really should in SSHIP. It's a lot more realistic. Alright, and let's get that army to move to Bryansk. We need to bring that under heel. And now we've got some additional money. Let's look to recruit more from our core territory of Yaroslavl and Moscow. I think at the moment it's not about the quality of the units per se. <laughs> it's all about the numerical number. The more the merica, merrier. We can get some senior um, sergeants from Moscow though. We've still got a navy up there in the Baltic. The Baltic fleet as it were. Okay, welcome to the top of the turn. Uh, one of our adopted generals can get married off. 
him. Yeah, so let's get him married off as quick as possible. I'm more than happy to accept that. Recruitment wise, there's the report. Okay. So, Spy is still in a good position. Merchant is near Moscow. We probably need more bishops eventually as well. Uh, diplomat, let's negotiate with the Kingdom of Poland. They're going to give us trade and map, but we have to pay them 1800 That's more than okay. And we've managed to be rewarded with two ballista, which is really nice. So we can roughly see where their lands are. And we'll move that further south. Okay, so we have a full stack here. Pushing to Buryansk. And we'll try and get a another stack going here. I might even put a fort down between these settlements. So we can get it going. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Yep, so now he has... Vladimir has the Lordship of Kiev, which is really good. Vesevalot has the Privy Seal. So po the Poles have moved up a full stack with a Piast. And then Lithuania just has a full stack there. Okay, so we might look to fight over that town. Potentially, we'll see how we go. Um, I guess I move you back. I could let Vladimir command it, actually. Now that he's got the, um... The retinue. That's what we really wanted. Yeah. Because Vesevalot is going to be... Well, not our faction leader at some point. Vladimir is going to be... The leader of this kingdom. But you never know. Sometimes faction leaders can last ages. But we are better off to farm him. Uh, maybe we look to go... South to Crimea, potentially. Oh, Lithuania doesn't like us. Because I reckon they're going to take that rebel territory. We're not going to have time. Um, we managed to get those three archers and then the two ballistas spawned in, eh? So we got nearly half a stack that was sitting in our capital of Novgorod. That's pretty good. I could move the capital to Kiev. Centralizing it might be a bit better. Like, Novgorod being so far in the north, is that good? Hmm. I'm not sure. I'm unsure just yet. Okay, let's end the turn and continue. Okay, so we have a candidate for adoption 18. Really loyal, not much chivalry, not much command. So he's coming to this line. Into the Rostislav line, sure. Let's bring him in. The inns are being completed as well. Yes. Okay. So one of my diplomats is in Lesser Poland. The other one's in Ukraine. Ah, oh, we've got the Holy Roman Empire here. Well, let's negotiate with their diplomat. 500 for 11 turns? I'm going to accept that. Oh, I'd love to get an alliance with the HRE, but it doesn't seem likely. Okay. The Cumans have an army there. Got to watch out for that. Let's build a fort east of Moscow. So that we can rally up the troops there. Uh, Vladimir. Okay, so the, that settlement has fallen to the Lithuanians, which is fine. I don't want to go to war with them just yet. I want to try and gobble up the rebel territory down in and around Crimea. I believe the Republic of Genoa, for some reason, holds that territory. Crimea, interesting. Peninsula held by so many people. Greeks, Tatar, <laughs> Genoa. And then now, hopefully, the Republic of Novgorod soon. And then we can project power and trade from Novgorod all the way down there. We can maybe recruit a navy, a Black Sea navy, to go into... Well, the Black Sea in Constantinople. Okay, welcome to the top of the turn. New family member. Nice. Retinue and those mines are being complete. Okay, so the full stack is now ready to move out. 
Um, well, it's been assembled. Give it another turn and it will be. Um, let's move you to Boryansk. We found some Yukis here. Um, the Moscovites or the Novgorodites. Novgorodites. I think that's how you would say it. <laughs> I'm going to run them down. Um, and it's a new faction leader there in Oleshi. Okay. It's a pretty big army there. Relationships have been worsened. And we'll try and move those units up. Um, yeah, we've got a general here to pick up that army that's coming from Novgorod. We need to secure our territorial uh, conquests there. Make sure we lock down Kiev. And then we're moving into Genoa territory, probably. Okay, now near the Carpathian Basin. The Cumans want trade and map. We'll accept that. That's pretty good of them to offer us that. I wouldn't actually mind making an alliance if I could. I don't really know what I could offer them. We're actually hemorrhaging in cash. Okay. Uh, nice. We've got a coming of age. So that is the... Um... Faction leader's 14-year-old grandson. Um, so we've negotiated with the HRE. Let's talk to the Kingdom of Hungary. They're not going to be too happy with us pushing into their Transylvanian, Romanian territory. Okay, so Genoa's there. Okay, rejected. Let us until at once. So they have Kaffa. So I guess we can rename that like Sevastopol or something. I don't know what it should be. Okay, let's see Jat Boryansk. And now we can finally move this other army. Uh, probably down towards the Caucasus potentially. So we've got about three full stacks in operation. Two fully mobilized moving about. Another like rallying up. We're making this other two here. So we're going to come close to five fully operational armies of this republic moving about. Got a lot of trebuchets and catapults and stuff there. Alright, well, let's fight this one against Dobroslav, the chivalrous, now 40. He is now the new faction leader. And... Prince Vladimir is going to take this one. We outnumber them by a thousand. We'll have to be a little bit careful as we push into Oleshi. Not the most complicated battle, but we are facing a faction leader, so he will have some various bonuses. Bringing up just the one battering ram, four ladders, two crossbows, and they're not going to be able to arc their shot, shot up and over the wall. Um... I will move my cavalry to a better position. I could go with the rotational shot, uh, but I think it will draw down their accuracy. I got some Slavic Javelinmen then. But now that they've lost their capital, their main recruitment hub, their political leadership has, well, fled, or is mostly dead now. We should be able to run down the last of them. We've got some infantry there that we can move on in eventually. But Arrow Towers seem to be whittling us down. At the moment, we haven't really faced that two crazy tier armies. It's mostly just arrow towers that are ruining us, essentially. Okay, 
Okay. It's going to be interesting to see how we go against different army builds. Because at the moment, we're currently fighting orthodox factions. Which won't be too long for this campaign, you would imagine. Unless we fight Byzantium, if we don't get an alliance with them. Actually, to be fair, some of that territory in and around Anatolia could be claimed. If we wanted to betray them. Take their standing. Make an agreement with the Turks. To carve up said territory, maybe. Um, but yeah, our lightly armoured units, that's what's really letting us down. Giving us kind of high casualties, I think is the theory. That'd be my, that'd be my guess. Because the Catholic factions are going to be a lot more heavily armoured. We've got the attack. But yeah, not so much. Same with Cumans. How are we going to go against those horse lords as well? It's going to be really interesting. This particular campaign. Oh, there's so many ways you can go. And I reckon if you were to start your own SSHIP campaign. As the Republic of Novgorod. Due to the sandbox experience of Total War, you could have a completely different playthrough. Maybe the Catholic factions rush you. Maybe the Danes push on in to try and take that old Varangian territory. Who knows? But you could get cut down in the Caucasus <laughs> by Cossacks. <laughs> okay, Vladimir's doing okay here. Turning into a bit of a prolific commander, old Vladdy Daddy. The battering has done its work. Now is the time for brave hearts. The conqueror of the Grand Duchy of Kiev. Really. Field battle, took the capital, and now is moving on to his second city. This one, all by himself. Vas Daddy Vasevalod helped him out, I guess. Okay. We're doing alright. We're progressing. We are slowly but surely moving our way into the city. Moving down into one of our new oblasts. I don't know what this would be. Probably Zaporizhia or something I don't know now. The outskirts of Crimea. Greater Crimea. Doing it. Doing what, um, Auntie Kathy. Catherine the Great. Uh, did a little bit earlier, I guess. Auntie Kathy. The re reoccupation of Crimea. <laughs> Crimea. Oh, God. Okay, so the balance of power has actually swung back a bit. Yikes. I can't see us losing this one. But we're just using a lot of casualties. Okay. Oh. Our men are winning the battle. 
We've lost half our men. No matter. This is our doctrine. Mass assault. Everyone go. Dobre, dobre. Okay. So... We're gonna struggle for this last bit. So, what you're better off doing if your infantry is like crushing, crumbling, and getting crushed like we're doing. Um, you can chuck your crossbows, particularly, and archers on the walls, and they're gonna be able to just shoot down. Oh, they're actually gonna try and snipe Vladimir. Hmm, I kind of respect that. The general's bodyguard coming out. 33 first, 45. Come on, then. Let's fucking have ya. Alright, maybe not. <laughs> don't want to lose Vladimir. <laughs> Get the archers to help. Get my Cossacks to draw their short swords. There we go, now we'll swing around in. And now we've got 200 or so. Pushing in. 16 remaining. And we're about to... Allow... The Great Trident Banner to fall again. The Trident of Poseidon. I'm assuming. It looks kinda cool. Lord be merciful, we have lost half of our men. Oh my god, his bodyguard just got crushed. The battle is very much in our favor. If we remain true and steadfast, victory will be ours. Okay, just need to hold on. Our men have oh, hang on, I think we just got him. Yeah, it's just the faction leader again. Another great general has fallen. Why? Why did you just submit to Novgorod? Okay, so some spearmen have come up there, that's annoying. So that just squandered my plan. Annoying. Okay, now they're starting to rout. Yeah, that's why you just have to be careful when you, um... Face faction leaders in a siege, they can just hold on for so much longer. And, um, give the units crazy buffs. Okay. We've just made our way into the city streets. Oh. Into the thick of it. We're going to be soon in the town square. Come on. Just this last little militia. Basically, just need to get everyone that's lurking out there in. Oh, so, so, so close. Come on, come on, come on. Nice, I think that's got him. Yep. We've taken command of the city. And... Aleshi is now ours. I think, I think I'm saying that right. I try my best. Victory is ours, but only Close victory. Damn. We lost what they deployed. Alright. Well, unfortunately on that note... It's probably time to wrap things up here. 
We've done a bunch here today, three battles or so, talked a bunch of history, we've managed to take Kiev, Oleshi, and another settlement, which I'm blanking. But, yeah, gotta wrap things up here. Thank you very much for watching. I've played for a couple of hours here today, and then I'm gonna try and edit this down to about an hour or so. But stay tuned for episode two, coming out tomorrow. Like, subscribe, uh, all that good YouTube stuff. Feel free to let me know feedback and suggestions, of course. Would really appreciate it. And stay tuned for more Total War campaigns on the channel. My name, as always, has been Simsy. Make sure to take care of yourselves. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Much love from Australia. I love you. Goodbye. Thanks, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.